five dollars they were selling on eBay. So uh, of course we bought the copy and we're you know last, last copy in the world. Some guy in Rome's going must get, must get. And uh, so anyway, without further ado, thank you. Hey, pleasure to be with you today. Should we open prayer before we begin? <clears throat> Father, we thank the Lord for this time that you're training now that you come to communicate the truths of thy word first and the truths of this culture and the Vatican that you served. And we pray, Father, for us give us a hearty hatred for evil and a love for righteousness. We thank you now for thy word, King James Bible, and we ask thy blessing Lord Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. Okay, um, I always like to start with a verse uh, before we say it. I'll start with the verse today since I'm not asked to speak publicly. <coughs> and Revelation 17 18. Revelation 17 18. If you read Revelation 17 18, and the woman which thou sawest is thy great city, which reigneth over the kings of the earth. It's a very important verse because we know that that great city is Rome. Rome is the city that's situated on the seven hills. And that city is identified in Revelation 17 and 9. And then of course the word hill and mountain are interchangeable words. It comes from the same Greek word orca. And so it sits on seven hills or seven mountains. There's only one city of the old world that was ever situated that way. Now, there's certain Jesuit temple coadjutors that want to tell you that Jerusalem is a city. And one of these temple coadjutors is Tex Mars. He will tell you that Jerusalem is a city on seven hills. And if you check your International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, you will find that Jerusalem was built on five hills. So don't let anybody get, get away with that argument that Jerusalem is built on seven hills. So Rome is the one that's built on seven hills. Its colors are scarlet and purple. And the merchants of the earth ultimately go back to be subject to her jurisdiction. And in this, come right in, ma'am, and have a seat. So, <clears throat> all the bankers go back to Rome. All the insurance companies go back to Rome. All the stock exchanges go back to Rome. All the whole hoarders of gold go back to Rome. It's all Rome. And the Jews involved in this are high-level Masonic Jews serving the Pope. Because in John 18, we see that the Jews said, we have no king to Caesar. We have no king to Caesar. And it's the same exact way today. The powerful Jews of the world, the Greenspans, the Kissingers, the others, they have no king but Caesar. They all serve the Pope. So uh, uh, what I want to alert you to is don't fall prey to the doctrine that the Jews rule the world, because this is Jesuit sophistry, for lack of a better word. They want to get us to violate Genesis 12, 1 through 3, that if we will curse the physical descendants of Abraham, then God will curse us. And that is a spiritual law of physics, that if any people does that, it's going to come back to them four, ten, a hundredfold. A classic example of this is Germany. When the uh, Lutheran Church went apostate in Germany, when it started to adopt all the rationalism that, the Ger that was brought into Germany in the 19th century, the Tübingen University and other places such as this, what did they do? They denied the Bible was the infallible and errant word of God, so it produced a whole group of Lutheran preachers that didn't believe Lutheran's Bible was the, was the word of God. And so as a result of this, then we have all sorts of pagans, and that ultimately are the foundation for the doctrines of fascism and Adolf Hitler. And then, of course, the Prussians, they were apostate. In fact, they had the first anti-Semitic Congress in Dresden in 1890, 1880, 1890. And that was where the most powerful Masonic lodges were. And one of the 99 lodges was in Dresden. Hitler was a member of one of the lodges in Dresden. It's all uh, Masonic, and therefore this Masonic is Gnostic, it's rationalistic. And therefore, will ultimately deny the word of God. And once you deny the word of God, that it's not the word of God, then they have a justification or the freedom in their mind to persecute the Lord's beloved Hebrew, Jewish, Israelites, people racially. Of course, we reject the Judaistic religion. We do not accept the Talmud. We believe that's an antichrist 
uh, doctrine, an Antichrist series of books. The Babylonian Talmud is evil. It calls Jesus Christ a bastard, his mother a whore. So we do not accept the Talmud and we reject it. This is all the traditions of men that Christ refused in his ministry. So, but we do have a love for them as a people, as a race of people, because we read in Romans 11 that hardness, that uh, blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. So as God is busy saying that a remnant of Jews and Gentiles from every race, language, kindred, and tongue, that fullness will one day come in according to Romans chapter 11. So we are living in this time warp uh, that I consider in between the 69th and 70th week of Daniel where God is building his church where Jews and Gentiles are equal in status according to Ephesians chapter 3. There is no difference between Jews and Gentiles in our status, uh, but that will change when the church is completed and when the Lord, I believe, appears for his church. And then the 70th week of Daniel will ultimately begin sometime after that with this covenant of death of Isaiah 28, verse 18 or so, that will ultimately bring a false peace to the nation of Israel. So what the devil wants us to do in the destruction of our nation, he wants us to go against the racial Jews, and this we cannot do. And anybody who advocates this, like Tex Mars and Michael Collins Piper and other Jesuit choirs you're going to find in the short way, you have to resist them in this. And you have to show that the Jews involved in this are all subject to the Vatican. For example, Alan Greenspan. Alan Greenspan, who is he? Ex-Federal ex Reserve Chairman. Ex-Federal Reserve Chairman. You don't mind if I talk to you and you talk back to me? No. Is that okay? That'd be fine. Okay. He was the expert of Reserve Channel. What is his race? Jewish. Yes. He's Jewish. Okay, what is his wife's race? Jewish also. With Barbara Walters? Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So here is a racial Jew manning the Federal Reserve Bank, head or the chairman of it. But what they don't tell you is, as I list in my book, at least two Jesuits who were involved in the orchestration and the running of the Federal Reserve Bank in New York City. And remember, the most powerful Federal Reserve Bank is the New York City branch. That's where they hold all the gold. Some, what, 600,000 ounces of gold. It's the largest gold hoard in the world. And, of course, they stole it from us from out of Fort Knox. There is no gold in Fort Knox. It was all taken over a period of 17 years. And you can read this in one of William Still's book. And it, was, it began to be taken out, I believe, during the Truman administration and the end of it during the Johnson administration. So well, all of our gold has been taken out of Fort Knox. They, they stole everything yesterday. His wife's name, Andrew Mitchell. Andrew Mitchell. Okay, thank you. Excuse me. So she's another Jew and CFR member. And I will add also, just as an aside, that all these powerful Jews are members of the Council on Foreign Relations. So here, the Vatican can say, look at all these Jews. They're doing this or doing that. And remember the CFR, why? They're the, they're the Zionists. Why? They're the, they're the labor Zionists. They're not the revisionist Zionists. They're not biblical Zionists as we would be. They're not orthodox Zionists as we reject that heresy. Uh, they are the labor Zionists which are communists. They are Masonic and they're servile to the Pope. And any Jew that resists the, the, the policies of the Vatican, like Yitzhak Rabin and others, will be terminated. They are all slaves. They're not allowed to have their own government. We're not allowed to have our government. The Russian people are not allowed to have their government. The Chinese are not allowed to have their government. All of these people. All of these dictators are really agents of the Vatican, and all of them are Masonic, or they're Knights of Malta in some fashion. So to understand this big picture, which is uh, really easy to see once you have the back, but let's go back in the past a little bit, okay? To begin with, the, the, dark, the Roman Empire was pagan. It was Gnostic, it was evil, its religion was pagan and evil. Uh, the, the Caesar was the priest and the king of the Roman Empire. Uh, <clears throat> the Lord's Church was born, Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost is fully come. The church begins to grow, first to the Jews, then to the half-Jews, the Samaritans, and then to the Gentiles. And as it begins to grow in the first century, it prospers. And the more we're persecuted, the more the Lord blesses us and prospers us. So the devil made a decision in about 312 A.D., when he decided, well, I can't kill the body of Christ, I can't kill it off, so you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to join it. And so in 312, he joined the church. And what he did was, he used his man of war, his vicious, bloody murderer, 
by the name of Constantine, who's been called the Great. And Constantine the Great, 312 AD, declared Christianity to be the religion of the empire. That is the beginning of the Roman Catholic institution, not one day before. And that is when the devil began to allow the destruction of his Roman political empire and in its place would become a religious political empire. And so now the Caesar, he would be the Pope. The Roman Senate would be the College of Cardinals. And so what these hypocrites are doing is they're masquerading as religious men who talk about Jesus Christ and salvation and the forgiveness of sins and peace when they're the most vicious bloody murderers on the face of the earth. They're huge kingdom builders, and there is no people anywhere that they will not totally annihilate if they get in their way to do so. One of the classic examples is Serbia under the Clinton administration. Clinton was used to mass bomb the Orthodox Serbs, okay? and they did it in our name. And they took your tax return and the taxes you paid, and they financed the interest on the national debt so they can well, operate that huge war machine in your name. I find that very offensive, extremely offensive, and very angering. That's right. Okay? So <clears throat> what, what uh, has happened is the, 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 whole, the, the Roman Catholic Church begins with Constantine the Great, just like Islam begins with Muhammad, just like Mormonism begins with Joseph Smith. It's all the same system. The, the Vatican is behind all these religions because she is the harlot and all these other religions, they're just simply little daughters of the harlot. Mm -hmm. She's the mother of harlots. Protestantism at one time used to be biblical. If it wasn't for Martin Luther, we would have no modern era. If it wasn't for Martin Luther and getting the Bible into the vulgar tongue and he's so condemned by the Jesuits and the Council of Trent, we would have no Oliver Cromwell, we would have no victory in the Thirty Years' War, we would have no George Washington, and we would have no written uh, constitution because that was written by a Presbyterian named Pelatiah Webster. He was the one who designed the workings of the American Constitution and it was a Baptist Calvinist by the name of James Madison and another Baptist Calvinist named George Mason who were responsible for the Bill of Rights. And they would not have spoken had it not been for a Baptist Calvinist preacher in uh, Virginia by the name of John Leland who said, if you don't put a Bill of Rights to that Constitution, we Baptists in Virginia, we're not ratifying. And Rhode Island did the same thing. The first square foot on the face of the earth where there was true religious liberty with John Clark and Roger Williams, these great Baptist Calvinist preachers, and they secured in Rhode Island true religious freedom and Rhode Island, those Baptists there who named their capital city Providence, said that if you do not put a Bill of Rights to that Constitution, Rhode Island is not ratifying, and Rhode Island was the last state to ratify the Constitution. I get attacked and say, you're being an activist. My Baptist forefathers were activists. My Baptist forefathers said, we will, have, we will be governed in this land pursuant to this book. Therefore, we want freedom of worship, and, and no government will ever tell us what we can do in our churches. Amen. No government will ever tell us what we can preach. When you do that, then it's time for the sword of just offense. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what Knox called it. Mm -hmm. You read the Reformation in Scotland, you read about John Knox and his sword of just offense. That's the second amendment was secured by Baptists, brethren. Right. By Baptists. So, <clears throat> in going back to the papacy now, the Roman Catholic institution, I don't call it a church, it's an institution. It's, right. it's a religious, political institution. It began in about 312. Then it had, they had their Council of Nicaea where they presume to tell us what the Word of God is. The papacy knows nothing of what the Word of God is. Right. And don't ever get caught up in the history of the Church Fathers, in the Nicene Creed, all that junk. It has nothing to do with us because our true forefathers were all killed. The histories that they wrote were all burned. And some of them are in the Vatican Library, which we will never see. So don't let anybody entrap you to going back to what the Church Fathers have to say, because that's how they wreck the Anglican Church. Okay, so the papacy is born. And what happens? By about 400, you have your first pope, your first papa. Okay, everybody needs a papa, right? <laughs> <laughs> so they have the first pope, and in uh, six... 600 or thereabouts, you have the doctrine of the spiritual power being conferred on this pope. And the doctrine of the spiritual power is this. 
There is no salvation outside the Catholic Church. Um, and if you do not submit to the, our spiritual power, you are not going to heaven. And you are also worthy of death. Mm -hmm. There is no salvation outside the Catholic Church, the Catholic institution. That's what the doctrine of spiritual power is. And these are very important. Whenever you see the Pope's flag, it has two keys going this way. And then on top, you have a triple crown. We have the triple crown race here in Kentucky. That, that goes right back to the papacy. Sure. Mm. You know, there, there should be no triple crown in Kentucky. Right. Uh, so, what well, these two keys, the first key is the temporal power. The other key, oh, the first key is the spiritual power. The other key is the temporal power. Temporal power was conferred on the Pope in 750 AD. Remember, 150 years. 600 at 150 at 750. Focus. An evil Roman emperor conferred this temporal power. Or Pepin did, excuse me. Focus conferred the spiritual power in 600. Pepin conferred the temporal power in 750. Both were bloody murderers. So as a result, we now have this man who sits in Rome who calls himself the Bishop of Bishop, Bishop of Bishops, and that of all the bishops in Christendom, quote unquote, he is supreme. Because he alone has spiritual and temporal power. And temporal power means this, that the Pope has the right to rule your country. He has the right to tell your president what to do. <coughs> he has the right to tell you what kind of money you're going to use. He has the right to tell you everything in the words of that evil, wicked Roman Catholic senator, Teddy Kennedy, everything from the cradle to the grave. That's right. Okay? That's what the temporal power is all about, gentlemen. And it's all going to come back to you very shortly because his temporal power is going to decree a draft in this country. And they're going to want to draft you and send you over to be slaughtered in Iraq for nothing. That's right. It's not our war. That's right. Okay? And you're going to have to make a decision. Am I signing up for the draft or am I not? And I know what I would do. And I told my sons, if you do, don't come back around me anymore. I slaved on my hands and knees floating and finishing trial, finishing and floating and finishing trialing, trialing concrete for 15 years, and I didn't sweat to raise you to go sacrifice yourself for a papal crusade. Amen. You need to be angry about this, brethren, because it's come, coming home real soon. So the temporal power is that he claims he has the right to rule your president, and we have had no president more a slave of the Pope than George W. Bush. Mm -hmm. They've all been his slaves since, really, Lincoln. Lincoln resisted him, and then he wanted to admit the southern states back on the same footing that they had left, and so did Seward, for which reason the Jesuits killed him, because the whole war was fought to destroy what Washington, that great southern Baptist, not southern Baptist, but he was a southerner, <laughs> he was a southerner, and he was a Baptist, because remember, Pastor John Gano, who was a Baptist preacher in New York, baptized him in the Hudson River, and it was John Gano and it was, John, it was uh, <clears throat> George Washington who gave John Gano his sword. And it's still in Pastor Gano's church to this day. You can read this in, uh, in Grady's work, uh, How Satan Turned America Against God, his first volume. He even has a picture of it. I put it in my book. It's a wonderful picture. So Washington the Baptist, the Calvinist, took up his sword of just defense in resisting the Anglican Church that had been taken over by the Jesuits and who were totally controlling King George III, just like they control George Bush today. Okay? So the papacy begins, it's, it's progressing on and on, and now these popes claim to have the right to kill any political leader that does not obey their wishes. Kill him, take his lands, and we will give them to another. You can read these very same things in the doctrines of Thomas Aquinas in the Summa Theologica, 63 volume work. He's called the Angelic Doctor. Thomas Aquinas was an evil, wicked sinner that I was taught in Bible college had the truth in his day. Remember, all these Bible colleges, brethren, are apostate. They're giving you a Westcott and Hort wrecked Greek text. It's pro Jerome's Latin Vulgate. It's all heresy from which all these versions come from. And how many places do you have to change the Word of God before it ceases to become the Word of God? How many? One. And in that Westcott and North Greek text is 5,788 places. 
in the King James Bible that they twisted and converted and perverted into the English Revised, English Revised Version. It's over 30,000 places. I tell you, all these Bibles, brethren, are hybrids. They don't have the ability to reproduce. They don't have the ability to impart faith because the Bible, the written Word of God, is inseparable from the person of the Son of God. It's, they're synonymous terms. Hebrews 12, Hebrews 4.12 tells me this is alive and powerful, sharp than any two-edged sword. This is alive. What makes it alive? The Spirit of God. There's some relationship to these words and letters and these paragraphs and whatever that makes it the Word of God that the Spirit invigorates in your life. And when you substitute this with another version, you do not have the Word of God. And God Amen. now is not able to bless you like He wants to. This is why it's so very important. This is why I thank God every day for your pastor who's King James only and refuses to incorporate. When you incorporate your church, you might as well just go commit fornication to the Amen. local prostitute down the street. Amen. It's just that bad. You should be very thankful that you are totally separate from the government, which is the way we ought to be because we have the church and we have the government and we have the family and and those three separate divine institutions should be separate. The church, the doctrine, and the Bible influence all of them, but they are separate. Amen. And we keep them separate. <clears throat> so we have the progressive the Roman Catholic institution. It continues to grow, and these popes now begin their wars. Now let's just review a little bit, because you young men are going to have to know something about Islam in your life. The satanic, evil, wretched, bloody religion of Islam. Islam was started by Augustinian monks. Augustinian monks of North Africa. Augustine, St. Augustine, City of God, Confessions, that pagan. He was the one very much responsible for getting the doctrines of Rome into the hands of ultimately the man who became Muhammad. But what does Muhammad do after he's brought to power? Why well, he's taught to hate the Jews, and he's taught the racial Jews, and he's taught to hate non-Roman Catholic North African Christians. So you see, what Romanism couldn't do with their sword, they created a surrogate to do their bloody work. That's why they created Islam. And so what does Islam do? Islam wages its huge jihad. And what does it do? It kills as many Jews as it can. It annihilates the North African church. Many of our black brethren in North Africa. Remember when the Ethiopian eunuch got the gospel mm -hmm. preached to him? And he went down and he started the North African black church in Ethiopia. And they were very vibrant believers. And they were not connected to Rome. And so Rome, after the Ethiopians ultimately were becoming apostate, then Rome sets out to kill them all. And with Islam they nearly did. Right. That's why North Africa today is all Muslim. They killed off our brethren in the 7th century, in the 8th centuries. They're going to do the same thing to us. Does that explain Mussolini going after Salazar? That's exactly right. That explains Mussolini attacking Abyssinia in 1935 because Mussolini was called the protector of Islam and they awarded him the sword of Islam and I have him on his horse raising the Islamic sword in my book that Libya awarded to him. And Mussolini, his advisor was a Jesuit who was a Society of Jesus secretary. His name was Pietro Tacci Venturi. What do you think the Jesuit connection is to Mussolini and his unity with Islam? The same exact unity that Himmler had with Islam when he uh, enlisted all the Hanshars in, um, in uh, Yugoslavia to slaughter the Serbs. They were called cutthroats. The Hanshars were the cutthroats. And they were in the SS. Fascism and Islam always works together. Don't ever forget that. And that's why George Bush, who is a fascist and a slave of the Pope, worked together with the, with the Bin Ladens and the Saud dynasty for 9-11. They're all working together to, to ultimately create this crusade against Islam, which in the days of James Jesus Angleton, who was the head of the counterintelligence for the CIA, he was calling for a war against Islam in 1970. And that's why they built the World Trade Center. They built the World Trade Center to bring it down. I had an engineer call me, and he said, we never welded the X-bracing on those buildings. 
All we ever did was bolt them. Because we, the justification for that was we were in a race to see who could have our building up first, Sears Tower or the World Trade Center. Hmm. Yeah. They laced that building with charges. They built that building to bring it down, just like they built the Titanic to sink it. That's how these Jesuits are. They always plan 50, 100 years ahead of time. Learn to think like they do. All right, so we have the beginning of the papacy. I need another glass of water. Right. I don't think that's water. That's okay. Anything. <laughs> okay, so the papacy is progressing. It creates Islam. And the deal was <clears throat> that we will finance you Muslims and we will back you Muhammad if, if in turn you kill these North African Christians but you don't bother the Augustinians and all their, their uh, monasteries. And also, when you take Jerusalem, that you give Jerusalem to the Pope. Well, God in his providence stepped in in restraining the mystery of iniquity, according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and caused those Muslims to not give Jerusalem to the Pope, call him an infidel, and reneged on their deal. That's what really happened. So what happens next? The Pope then starts his crusades. Because remember, the Vatican has always wanted Jerusalem. Why? Because the Vatican is run by the devil. And what does the devil want? The devil wants Jerusalem more than any other city to place his throne there so he can be worshipped worldwide and internationally. The devil's great plan for himself is to be just like Christ. I will be like the Most High. I will ascend above the clouds of heaven. Uh, I, will, I will be like, I will love I will be like the Most High, and I will ascend upon the mount of the sides of the congregation of the north. That is Jerusalem. He wants Jerusalem to be his place of worship. So therefore, in using the papacy, he ignites these crusades. And the first crusade takes Jerusalem, but guess what? The guy who takes Jerusalem decides, well, I'm not going to hold it for the Pope. I'm going to hold it for me. <laughs> Later on, another crusade, Richard the Lionheart, comes, he's in, in, the, in the view of Jerusalem, he's ready to take Jerusalem for the Pope, he calls a meeting, and he says, well, no, I don't think I'm going to take it. Turns around, goes home. <laughs> so we can see the providential hand of God involved in not allowing the Crusaders and the Pope to take Jerusalem until 1917, when the British took Jerusalem from the Turks, and then ultimately, the British, because they're controlled by the Jesuits, they give ultimately Jerusalem to the Pope's Masonic Jewish labor Zionists that helped the Nazis murder nearly 7 million Jews in Eurasia. This is something you will also not be told very much. That's right. We'll go to this one. The only other party allowed to function in Nazi Germany were the labor Zionists, not the revisionist Zionists. And you know the difference between the revisionist Zionists and the labor Zionists? No. no. Okay. The, re the revisionist Zionists were led by a man named Vladimir Jabotinsky. Vladimir Jabotinsky was a, a true Jew. He was a Jew that wanted Israel for the Jewish people and to be governed by people that would be governing for the benefit of the Jewish people. Vladimir Jabotinsky went to Poland because he knew of the plot to destroy the Jews of Poland and Eurasia. And I, so I'm going to go back a little bit farther, okay? Tsar Czar Nicholas I, in about, 14, in about uh, 1847 or so, who had a conquer down with the Pope, began to drive the Jews out of Russia to the western part of Russia, called the Pale of Settlement, and began to con congregate them there, and which is today the Ukraine, Poland, Lithuania, these places. <clears throat> Alexander II came to the throne. He hated the Pope. He stopped the conquered death. He broke off diplomatic relations with the Vatican. And so what and what does he do? He also frees four million serfs. I mean he did an evil thing. He helped Lincoln with the blockade, which was not very virtuous. He thought he was doing right. But 
Uh, he also, in the day of his murder, when he was assassinated, that morning he had signed a constitution limiting his powers as a czar. So, on the fifth attempt, the Jesuits murdered him, blew his legs off, and uh, his son comes to power, Alexander the Third. Alexander immediately, the no, the third, the second is killed. Alexander the First is before Nicholas. I. Okay, so Alexander the Third comes to power, and what does he do? He undoes everything his father does. No constitution. We're going to keep our secret police, the Okrana. And, and we're going to continue to build this pale of settlement. And because a Jew was involved, because the Jesuits controlled the anarchists, and there was a Jew involved in this, they blamed it on the Jews and started their huge pogrom in the 1880s, killing 300,000 Jews in Russia, and driving the rest of this, what's called this pale of settlement. Similar thing happened with Nicholas II, who was the last czar. Nicholas II further persecutes the Jews in 1904, drives more of them to the Pale of Settlement. So what are the Jesuits doing? The Jesuits, which are formally banished in Russia by Alexander I in 1820, they're not legally allowed there, but secretly through their secret societies and others, they're running the Tsar. The Tsar knows it. They're building this Pale of Settlement. They're rounding up the Jews of Russia in Eastern Europe and forcing them into this Pale of Settlement for their annihilation for their annihilation under Hitler and Joseph Stalin. We must remember that World War II was run by the Jesuits and they controlled all the factions. Forget about allies. Forget about Axis. FDR, without, without the Dawes plan and J.P. Morgan, there is no Nazi Third Reich. That's right. That, that was all financed by us. That's it. And then they're going to send my dad over there and be a tail gunner in a B-17 and risk his life fighting an enemy that was paid for on Wall Street? The same damnable things being done right now. You realize Osama bin Laden was built by the CIA? That's right. Do you realize the Taliban was built by the CIA to supposedly fight the Soviets? I'll tell you, if Russia wanted to end the Taliban in Afghanistan, it would be a very easy thing. It's no sweat. They would have easily eliminated them. Why didn't they do it? Because the men running Russia and the men running the U.S. are all subject to the Vatican through high-level Freemasonry in the Knights of Malta, and they used that, that Russian war in Afghanistan as a justification to build our enemy that would be used against us in the future. That's what they did. So we have to think dialectically. We have to be able to start thinking along ten different lines. What's happening here? What's happening here? What's happening here? What's happening here? Oh, now it all dovetails. Now I see what's happening. And because we're white, because the white race has a superior intellect to the other races, we have the ability for this. And by the way, the greatest servants of the Lord have been white. We wrote all the systematic theologies. We did all the preaching. We're the ones who sent the gospel to the ends of the earth. We're the ones who worked hard every day. And the greatest servants of the devil have been white. I've never seen a black pope I've never seen uh, the devil use the black race to run all the lodges. What we have here is an absolute case of racial white supremacy on both sides. Forget these ideas of universal equality. They're not true. Those are the doctrines of communism. <clears throat> so now we have the, the Vatican uh, using their Masonic Jewish labor Zionists with the Nazis to round up and kill the Jews of the Pale of Settlement. And then, who's going to get blamed? Why well, will blame the German people? Because you see, Germany is the heart of the Reformation. And so we'll, we're going to shame the German people from now on, so they're ashamed to ever call themselves Germans, because after all, aren't all Germans Nazis? We forget about the 20,000 Germans that Himmler beheaded beheaded when they refused to follow Hitler. So as a result, now Germans get to pay. They get to pay and finance the Messiah Jewish labor Zionist government of Israel. I'm for the Jews being in their land. It's their land. God never took it away from them. It's their land. They have a right to. As far as I'm concerned, all the Muslims can move out. There's no such thing as a Palestinian. They're all Muslim, Arab, squatters on the land, and it's not theirs. And they can have Jordan, they can have Syria, they can have Saudi Arabia, they can have all those other countries. 
But the Vatican will not permit it. Because you see, the Vatican controls Yasser Arafat, or did. He had nine audiences with the Pope. And the Vatican, con Vatican controlled Ariel Sharon, Ben Gurion, Hein Wiseman, Kastner, all of them. So the Vatican is controlling both sides of the leadership so that the people never have any relief. So, and that's exactly what we have here. That's exactly what we have in Russia. That's exactly what we have in China. Okay. So what we have now is we have the Vatican with Islam. And so what did the Vatican do to get Islam back? Well, in the province of God, he sent the Protestant Reformation. Now, I know the Protestants persecuted us. I know they said, well, you believe in immersion? I think we'll immerse you and we're going to drown you. Mm -hmm. Amen? That's right. They persecuted us. Unfortunately. Unfortunately. But nonetheless, if it was not for the Protestant Reformation, the dark ages of the Pope would not have ended. And we'd still be in the Alps somewhere, and worshiping in secret and preparing for our next slaughter by the French armies coming after us, whoever it might be. So it was the white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, with the help of certain Baptists, like Oliver Cromwell, who brought the world out of the dark ages. And that means we set in stone the right to freedom of speech, freedom of press, and freedom of conscience. Okay? That's ours. That doesn't belong to the Protestants. That's ours. And it's more important to us, it should be more important to us, those freedoms in life itself. And so as a result, <clears throat> the modern era begins in 1648 with the end of the Thirty Years' War. Every historian, any history class you'll ever take, the modern era begins in 1648 with the signing of the peace of Westphalia. With that becomes, Germany starts to prosper and it develops a middle class. Germany has freedom of conscience now, so that it can invent. Switzerland has freedom of conscience, so we can invent. And where are the finest watches? Where are they made? Switzerland. Switzerland. Where are the finest cars? Where are they made? Germany. Who makes the finest guns? The Germans. Who makes the finest crystal? The Germans, the Swiss, the Dutch. Who has the finest engineering and technology and architecture? The Germans, the Swiss, the English. Who builds the finest ships? The Protestant English, the British Navy. So what you have is the birth of this huge white Anglo-Saxon Protestant and Baptist middle class where we now can save our money, where we now have gold and silver. Every country in Europe has gold and silver coins. You know why? Because it's honest money. It's honest money. Somebody had to dig it out of a hole, they had to smelt it, and they had to coin it. And in exchange for that labor, I give you my labor. And it's an even exchange. Right. And what's this? What's this junk? Worthless paper. It's worthless fiat paper. Might as well, uh, you know, use it for something good, like... Put it in the trash. Who knows? <laughs> <clears throat> so, we had honest money. So that means when you saved a silver dime when you were 10, it had the same worth when you were 90. And so, so no one could steal your wealth. And the banks, they were storehouses. They stored your coins. They had an honest banker. They stored your coins. And you could take them out and spend them or save them. So we had honest money. When you have honest money, and you have laws that protect your basic rights of freedom of conscience, freedom of speech, freedom of press, you're going to prosper. That's right. You can't help it. He that doesn't work, neither let him eat. That's right. We had what was called the Protestant work ethic, which is the Baptist work ethic, where we get up every morning and we go to work. We do something. We're not happy unless we're busy. Unless we're busy about our father's business. Whatever it might be, we're busy, busy, busy. We're not a lazy people. Okay? called the Protestant work ethic years ago. And when you have that, you then have a guy that made some money here with a guy that made some money over here. They say, hey, let's go together. I got an idea. You know what? I think I can make a light bulb. Oh, okay. So I'll, we'll put our monies together and we'll work on this and lo and behold, we create a light bulb. If it wasn't for white Anglo-Saxon Protestant America, there are no lights. 
Another guy gets together and says, you know what? We can build a textile mill. And we're going to have the most beautiful fabrics anybody's ever seen because we don't have to hand stitch them anymore. We have machines that can do this. And now we have the industrial revolution where machines can be used to replace what people did. And we can have more of it and it can be nicer. There is no nation that is sovereign, that has true wealth, that does not have a manufacturing base. You get rid of our manufacturing base, you might as well just, you, don't even, you can't even flip burgers at McDonald's anymore. And that's exactly what the Jesuits are doing. They're driving our manufacturing base out of here. It's high treason. And the people going along with it, these manufacturers, most of them are Knights of Malt, William F. Buck, Lee Iacocca, Rupert Murdoch, all a bunch of stinking papal slaves and knights loyal to the Vatican, and they couldn't care less about us. We're just uh, human resources like a tree. Natural resources, human resources, that's how they look at us. We're expendable. They have, no, they have no concern for us. They have no nationalism. See, there's nothing about a Christian. In the last days, perilous times shall arise. Men shall be lovers of themselves, heady, high-minded. Traitors. Mm -hmm. That's it. Treason is a sin. A Christian man who believes this book is not a traitor. He is loyal to his nation. And he dies first before he betrays. That's the way it is. Death and life is not that valuable because we've got to look at ourselves in the mirror every day. And when I look, do I see that I betray? Betray us out the Son of Man with a kiss. Even though Judas was a wicked man, he couldn't handle his conscience, he went out and hung himself. We do not betray. We are loyal. I say to my wife all the time, I'm a good dog. Ever seen a dog betray his master? They're always there with his master, they'll die right there with his master. I respect that. And that's how a Christian is. So, <clears throat> what has happened is, uh, these men are selling us out, and it's all because of Rome, because Rome is destroying the Protestant Reformation West. You young people in your lives will see the destruction of Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, and of course Bill Clinton was a part of that, Rhodesia, the United States, Protestant Canada. All these historic white Protestant nations are to be destroyed in this century, and it will happen unless some men of God stand in the breach. Now, here's another bone of contention that I have. I'll take a drink before I mention it. Two of them. We have no true Calvinism today. All the Calvinists that I ever met, the vast majority, were fatalists. Well, God's so sovereign, he'll save his elect, therefore I don't have to get out and preach the gospel, right? <laughs> Wrong. One of the greatest evangelists you ever read, Spurgeon and others were five-point Calvinists, and they were all preachers of the gospel. Amen. The Dutch preachers, they used to be escorted by a hundred mounted troopers when they would preach on the hillsides to the Dutch people. Because if they weren't escorted by those troopers, they would have been killed by the priests. And what do they do? They preached in the open air. And thousands of them were saved. You read Motley's Dutch Republic. It's a free yeah. mindset. You read about Motley. He also wrote the United Netherlands. There were great preachers. We've got George Whitfield. What was he? He was a Calvinist. And what did he do? He preached all the time. He had a voice that could be heard from a mile away. Jonathan Edwards, Calvinist. Preaching sinners in the hands of an angry God in a monotone a monotone, and those people were crawling in the poles, not wanting to fall into hell. So, what we have is a true Bible-believing evangelist who believes in the sovereignty of God, preaches, and God does His work. We do our work in preaching the gospel, and He does His work in saving His elect. Because the Apostle Paul said that that he preached the gospel to all men that he might present, present every man perfect in Christ, Colossians 128. And he also said that I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they too may obtain salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. You guys are going to have some hardships in your life. One of you is going to be crippled. Another is going to have your hand cut off. Another one of you, who knows, might be an iron lung. Whatever's going to happen to you, it's all in the providence of God, so you need to trust Him and learn to trust Him, whatever befalls you.
And of course, hating sin and staying away from it with all your heart, which so easily besets every one of us. We live in such a wicked, sinful culture that it slaps you on the face everywhere you go. Learn to hate it. The Lord Jesus Christ loved righteousness and he hated it. So, <clears throat> with regard to the Vatican, the Vatican is now, uh, how did they deal with these crusades? Well, we had the Protestant Reformation, we had the beginning of the middle classes, we had the beginning of private wealth, we had the beginning of an industrial base. We had prosperous white northern European nations that brought political liberty to the ends of the earth, brought commerce around the world. And the circumnavigation of the earth was discovered by white Protestant nations, England and Holland. None of this history has ever been taught to us, because you can't know it. So then, as a result of this reformation with Luther, and the getting of the word of God into the hands of the common man, you have the counter-reformation with Ignatius Loyola. And what does Loyola want to do? He wants to destroy the reformation, and he wants to take Jerusalem from the Muslims. Francis Xavier, a very powerful Jesuit, said, Would to God there was a world with no Jews and no Muslims. And so, we're going to see in this crusade a great massive annihilation of the Muslim peoples. And we're going to be blamed for it. Because Tony Blair is already pulling out his troops out of Iraq. Because it has to be an American-led crusade. A few more hints. Why in the world would they have Guantanamo as a prison for these Muslims. Why would they do that? I mean, why ship them all the way over here? It goes back to Fidel Castro. Why did the CIA give Fidel Castro Cuba? Because That's you right. see, because you see, it was they called uh, Eisenhower called Fidel Castro the Abraham Lincoln of Cuba. Because Cuba is to be our staging base for invasion. Cuba is a staging base for American invasion. That's why they gave it to him. Cuba will never be free. And so now that's why they use Guantanamo for that, to bring all these guys over there so they can torture him and create more hatred in the minds of the Arabs towards us. Yeah. The great Satan. And then because the Arabs believe the Jews run this country, why is the Jews that's running the country? So that creates more hatred for the Jews. When the righteous Jews who don't have a voice say the Jews don't run this country, it's those satanic Jews in the law serving the Pope that runs this country. That's right. Because I have some Jewish brethren that lived in Israel for 15 years, and they tell me, they told me how the Talmudic Jews went and pushed the, the walls into their church and destroyed their church. The Talmudic Jews are the real power behind the Zionists, the labor Zionists. The, 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 rab, the chief rabbi of Jerusalem, the chief rabbi of Rome, serve the Pope. They're Masons. And that's another thing we have to learn. A Masonic Lodge serves the Vatican. Every faction of Freemasonry that you will ever see will ultimately serve the Vatican. That means the White Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. All Masonic as of 1915. That's it. The first Ku Klux Klan I would have been in. Because they came down to my south. I'm, I'm half Confederate. They came down to my south. My, my south, they were carpet bagging out of the north. They were using the blacks to rape our women. They took our plantations, said 40 acres and a mule. And all the white men said, we're not having this because we have no government down here. We're under martial law. And so they decided to night ride with Nathan Bedford Forrest. Nathan Bedford Forrest was a Mason, but he ceased to be active in the lodge. And after the horrible supposed ratification in 1868 of the 14th Amendment, which was never really ratified, that following year in 1869, Nathan Bedford Forrest abolished the Klan. He said, it's become too violent, and I want nothing more to do with it. That was the good Ku Klux Klan. That was a bunch of men refusing to allow these northern carpetbaggers to use their former servants against them and destroy their culture. So Albert Pike took it over. That evil wicked sin. So Albert, so Albert Pike kept it going out of Arkansas. And then in 1915, they started the second clan. And the second clan was fascist, Masonic, 
and it was designed to persecute blacks so it would create sympathy for them, for the socialist, communist, civil rights movement, which was also Masonic. They met in Masonic lodges. A. Philip Randolph, he was the black leader of the civil rights movement. He's Masonic. So when you see A. Philip Randolph, I have a picture of him in my book, A. Philip Randolph and Lyndon Johnson shaking hands right there in the White House. Here's Brother Mason Lyndon Johnson, trained by Jesuits at Georgetown University, shaking, shaking hands with black Freemason A. Philip Randolph, who was the Masson of Martin Lucifer King. The King's real name was Michael King. He never changed his name. I call him Martin Lucifer in my book. Martin Lucifer King. Martin Lucifer King, my God, was a great integrationist. The Vatican wants to integrate every white Protestant nation to make it a nation of color so it will cease to be able to resist the Vatican and those powerful, brilliant white men who run it. That's what they're doing. That's what this integration is all about. When the Bible teaches that God created the races, the black race, the white race, and the oriental race, to keep mankind separate. That's why interracialism, integration, is satanic. It's evil. It's wicked. There should be a nation for white people, a nation for black people, a nation for orientals. They have their own national sovereignty. They govern themselves. And never the three meet. That's the way it's supposed to be. Whenever you have forced race mixing, you have crime, white on black crime, black on white crime, and it ultimately leads to race war. And that's what we're going to get here. We're going to get a race war. Talk about it in the book. Because you've got the Masonic Knights of the Ku Klux Klan, and you've got the Masonic Nation of Islam. Louis Farrakhan's a Mason. Warth is a Mason. Elijah Muhammad was a mason. And what are they doing? They're teaching hatred for the white man, all white men. Was the Ku Klux Klan teaching? Hatred for the black man, all black men. Well, the Klan at one time used to be very Protestant and used to go after the Vatican. So what we see is the Vatican using Freemasonry to control all these factions. Mormonism. They killed 120 Protestants. Methodists. Methodists. A massacre when they were trying to go through uh, uh, Utah. 9-11. 9-11, okay. Yeah. And so they, uh, they killed those Protestants. And why? Because Joseph Smith and later Brigham Young, both Freemasons, both Scottish Rite, were taking orders from Jesuit Pierre de Schmidt, America's most powerful Jesuit at the time, who was a personal friend of Burnham up General Sherman. And Sherman's son, Thomas Sherman, became a Jesuit. And he was a favorite of the dirty, stinking Theodore Roosevelt. Don't ever let anybody tell you Theodore Roosevelt was a hero. He was a dirty, stinking traitor. It's under Theodore Roosevelt they create the Food and Drug Administration in 1906. So they can tell you what you can eat. And make sure you get sick. Right. So the Food and Drug Administration makes sure you get good and vaccinated now. Yeah. So you don't get sick now. <laughs> it's the Food and Drug Administration that's going to police all the nature paths and all the chiropractics and all that. So they can't really help us. Because you've got to have a weak, pounded down, white population that's sick and eating out of McDonald's. And we got to eat all these oranges sprayed with all this crud on it so we can get liver disease and ultimately cancer. We cannot be healthy. They don't want you healthy. They don't right. want you eating good food. They want you sick. And they want all your children vaccinated with what? In the name of Christ. 22 vaccinations before they're two? It's enough to be angry about. And to my little son, Phil Downey, he uh, sprained his wrist and we had to take him to the hospital and here in, uh, next to the, in uh, Orlando. <clears throat> And a nice black lady came in and she said, uh, and what's uh, your date of birth? I said, well, I don't use that. <laughs> a social security number? I don't have one. <laughs> oh, okay. Now, one more question. Sorry. My son, uh, uh, they, they asked him, uh, has he had all those vaccinations? I said, no, we don't vaccinate. Amen. Ever. For anything. Amen. It's all poison, all monkey pus. 
and all kinds of urine and whatever you want to call it, putting in your bloodstreams of your children before they even have an immune system, giving a hepatitis vaccination to your newborn, and, she, and the newborn's never nursed the colostrum of the mother's milk, so she has, so the baby has no immune system. You can't vaccinate someone and expect to build their system if they don't have an immune system. These doctors are all against us. That's it. They're against us, and the doctors that are not are driven out of this country to Mexico. It's a whole grand conspiracy in the medical profession, and that dirty, stinking Theodore Roosevelt helped to start it. Now, what else? Well, we have the BI, the Bureau of Investigation. They start that in 1908. It was called, quote unquote, by a congressman, the bureaucratic bastard, because it was never voted into law. It was an executive order, brother. FBI. F the BI, and then later the FBI in 1924. It was first called the Bureau of Investigation, and it was never created by a law passed by our Congress. The Bureau of Investigation is the Vatican's holy office of the Inquisition in this country. Amen. They are a branch of the Inquisitors, and the Justice Department is the Inquisition, created in 1870. And so they have all these inquisitors, the IRS, the FBI, the BATF, the DEA, and who knows? They all they're, they're all carrying guns. Homeland Security. Homeland Department of Homeland Security. So what they're doing is, this is what the Vatican is doing. <laughs> if, if some of you are getting bored, I can stop and you can ask me yeah. questions. Yeah. Can, can, can we go on the board? Sure. Okay. That's a Malta. You want to take a break or are you no, okay? I'm fine. I'm fine. I just want to be where you are. The Knights of Malta were started in about 1099. They were the little first crusaders. They were called the Hospitallers. They went to Jerusalem to supposedly give succor and help to the uh, pilgrims going there. The Knights of Malta became a military order. They later changed their job, name to the Knights of Rhodes and ultimately to the Knights of Malta, but they're known today as the Knights of St. John of Jerusalem. They're also called the Hospitallers because they started hospitals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the Knights of Malta are a military organization. They have never been suppressed by the Pope, and their whole purpose was to get Jerusalem back for the Vatican. To do so, they have to control the banking, the politics of every country. And so, as of this moment, there are about 15,000 Knights of Malta in the world. They compose the Illuminati bloodlines. They compose the blue bloods of Europe. Okay? They're all Knights of Malta. With their first and foremost loyalty to the Vatican, not to their own people. They are not nationalists, as we will be. And so the Knights of Malta, who run the banking, are men like Felix Larkin. Mm -hmm. Felix Larkin was the head of, uh, I believe it was uh, Morgan Bank for many years. All the banks in New York are run by the Knights of Malta. J.P. Morgan Chase is run by the Knights of Malta, and J.P. Morgan has a direct telex from New York City to the Vatican. Well, let anybody tell you the Jews run it. It's the Gentile Knights of Malta. There are some Jews who converted to Rome, like Louis Lerman, the head of Rite Aid. All your Rite Aid drugstores owned by the Knights of Malta. That's right. Pfizer, Merck, all your pharmaceuticals run by the Knights of Malta. Uh, Elmer Holmes, Elmer Holmes Bops, who was the head of Warner Lambert, Knight of Malta, and he willed his estate to the Archbishop of New York City when he died. O'Connor? No, um, I think it was Cook. Cook or O'Connor, one of the two. Elmer Holmes Bops, in fact, he was from Lidditz. I used to live in Lidditz, Pennsylvania. He has a great, huge place called the Hutnut or Warner Lambert, all owned by the Knights of Malta. Lavoris? Every time you buy Lavoris, you're patronizing the Knights of Malta. They are the sinners that put fluoride in our toothpaste. Yep. Aluminum rounds, that's right. They control the whole, in fact, they have, they have moved our aluminum processing plants 
to China, and I have a friend that's in the aluminum trade, and he says there's 21 aluminum smelters on the coast of Red China. And what are they for? They're for airplanes. They're for jets. They're for a military operation. All provided by the Knights of Malta. Here's another one. Ever heard of Alexander Haig? Yeah. yeah. Knight of Malta, he's the senior honorary advisor of Costco. Costco's run the Knights of Malta. Who runs Sam's Club? Who runs, uh, what's that other operation? Walmart. Walmart. The Knights of Malta. But they put some Jew. The, the head of it called Sam. Is what Sam? What's his name? Walton. Sam Walton. We're going to put a Jew up front to so make it look like the Jews own it. It's all written by the Knights of Malt. Um, who was more than I? Matter of fact, Alexander Haig's brother, he's a Jesuit. Francis Haig. Hmm. Powerful Jesuit. And he was also involved in the impeachment of Nixon. You always have Knights of Malta whose brother's a Jesuit. The Kennedy assassination, as I cover, James J. Rowley, who was the head of the Secret Service at the time of the assassination, he's a good Irish Catholic boy. Secret Service. Secret Service. Mm -hmm. And he was a Knight of Malta. James J. Rowley had a brother named Francis Rowley. He's a Jesuit, or was a Jesuit, who worked at the Federal Reserve Bank in New York City. So the Knights of Malta, they run the banking, they run the politics. I have a whole list of their names in my book. I think you find it very intriguing. And uh, the, the, well, Rick Santorum is a senator from Pennsylvania. He's not a Malta. His wife's a Dane. And there's Danes in Malta. If you've got to have the knight, you've got to have the Dane. Right? <laughs> Another Dane of Malta was Claire Booth Luce, the Luce Empire. Henry Luce, who on Time Life, all Knights of Malta. Newsweek. All these magazines controlled by the CFR, written by the Knights of Malta. Myron uh, uh, Fagan, uh, My Myron Taylor, who was the uh, Knight of Malta, a supposed ambassador to the Vatican during World War II. We had no legitimate ambassador to the Vatican. FDR sent him anyway. The Knights of Malta put FDR in power through Joe Kennedy. Joseph P. Kennedy was a Knight of Malta, and he got FDR elected because he was working with that other Knight of Columbus, um, uh, Joe um, Al, Al, uh, Al Smith of New York. The Vatican controls both political parties. Don't think for one minute there's a different, there's been a difference between the Republicans and the Democrats. It's like George Wallace said. That man said a lot of right things. The unfortunate part is that he had no protection because he was a Freemason. When you join that Masonic Lodge, you get a demon attached to you, and you don't have the protection of God anymore until you repudiate it publicly and seek God for forgiveness, and then he'll take away the devil from you. Amen. So <clears throat> the Knights of Malta, they run the banks, they run the credit system, they run MetLife. Um, <laughs> uh, just a, if you go to the Council on Foreign Relations, get their annual report, you can see all the companies that the CFR controls. Ford, uh, Lockheed, McDonnell Douglas, Boeing Aircraft, all of them run by the Vatican. And you see what they've done. They have implemented communism here. All ten planks of the Communist Manifesto are in place here. They're making you pay an income tax on your wages, which no court has ever said you have to pay. There's never been a decision that says wages are income. Never. So what does that tell you about all these judges? It tells you that they're all corrupt. They're, every stinking one of them is corrupt. And in every court, you will see a flag, and it is trimmed in gold fringe. And you just try to ask that judge, Judge, what does that mean? What does this flag trimmed in gold fringe mean, a state flag and a federal flag? Tell us, would you, Your Honor? Why, you stupid idiot, get out of my court! I had one say to me, get out of my court, don't ever come here again. Parasus, I'll never forget him, a punk. <laughs> you ask that judge why there's flag trimmed with gold fringe. Because you see, in Title IV of the United States Code, only the commander-in-chief can fly that flag. That's a military color. That flag's for the Army and for the Air Force and for the Marines and the Navy. Those are military colors. Therefore, that court, if you go into a court's marshal and they're flying a flag trimmed to gold fringe, 
That court is not part of the judicial branch of government. It's part of the commander in chief, right. where it ought to be when it comes to military issues. If you see that movie, A Few Good Men, it should, watch how that court is set. That's a military court. There's a jury of nine people. You don't need a 12-man jury in a military court, like the common law says we should have. And so as a result, the flag is trimmed in gold fringe. You tell me, when you go to any state court in Florida here, you're going to see two flags. They're both trimmed in gold fringe. That's telling you one thing. That this court is not a judicial court. Because in the Constitution, you have Article I, which is the legislative. You have Article II, which is the executive. And you have Article III, which is the judiciary of the, of the sections. Section 1, 2, 3. Article III court. So because the Article III courts are to be separate from the executive. The Article III courts are to be separate from the legislative. We don't have those anymore. They're gone. And there will be no judge who will tell you that. They're all corrupt. They're all thieves. And they all want us just to comply with what they want. I tell you this. Refusing to file a tax return in this country is a greater crime than murder. Because you see, they want to shove that down everybody's throat so that the Federal Reserve can keep extending credit to the Congress to fight the Pope's crusades. And this is nothing new. The crusades were fought in the Dark Ages, financed by an income tax on the royals and the priests. Nothing new. It did it again. And so therefore, I recommend that every one of you get registered to vote, and whenever you go to a case where it involves a tax issue, you hang that jury. Not guilty. That's right. You're free to go. That's right. You hang it. Because the jury is the fourth branch of government. So they stole our Article III course from us, and no judge will ever tell you that. That ought to give you all kinds of anger for what they did to us. <clears throat> And it's, this is exactly how Britain works. Britain has a parliament, has a king, and under the king is the king's bench. There is no separate judicial branch of government anymore. It's the same way with the Vatican. You have the College of Cardinals and the Pope, and underneath the Pope you have the sacred rota. The court is not separate from the Pope. So that's what they did here. They fashioned our government to comport with how the Vatican Empire runs, and how they run the Vatican Empire is how they run the American Empire. Identical. That's why you have a birth certificate when you're born. See, it's your baptismal certificate. Hmm. That's what it is. It's your citizenship. That's your citizenship. When a Roman Catholic is baptized and they get that baptismal certificate, they are a citizen of the Vatican Empire. And they have privileges and immunities. And guess what? The Roman Catholic people have to pay an income tax on their wages to the church. It's like they shoved down our throats. Okay. I can tell people are getting a little maybe take a break a little bit or any questions or well we're gonna we're gonna take a break at noon. Okay. I'll keep going. Can you get twenty minutes? Sure. Can uh, would it be to uh, to ask uh, the connection between uh, the House of Stuart, uh, Queen Elizabeth and such with uh, Prince Charles and such a little book that came out a while back called The Antichrist and the Cup of Tea. I think you saw it by Cohen. Uh, it traced a little bit about the bloodline stuff. Is there anything in there also? Yes. Um, uh, Mr. Cohen's work says that ultimately the Antichrist is going to be English. Uh, yeah, I've seen that. Um, but the devil has his royal bloodlines. In England, it's the Stuart. In Austria, it's the Habsburg. In Spain, it's the... Um, uh, Juan Carlos, the, the Bourbon bloodline. They have maintained their bloodlines in the background uh, while they have their stewards up front. George Herbert Walker Bush is a steward. George W. Bush is a steward. They're both royal bloodlines. That's why George Bush says the Constitution is just a GD piece of paper to me. Isn't that nice? Any other time they would have taken him out and shot him. For that. So the royals are all knights. George Herbert Walker Bush is a knight of Malta. George Herbert Walker Bush's brother Prescott Bush Jr. is a knight of Malta. 
And Prescott Bush Sr., who helped to finance the Nazis and bring Hitler to power, was trained by Jesuits at Stonyhurst before he went to Yale and became a member of Skull and Bones, and then he became an Adamalta and worked with Fritz Thiessen in the financing and building of the Third Reich and the communist system in Russia, which was worse than the Third Reich. We never hear about that. We need to remember Joseph Stalin was worse than Adolf Hitler. He killed over a million Jews himself. And Stalin's NKVD and Hitler's Gestapo worked together in the Katyn massacre when they killed 15,000 Polish officers, shot them in the back of the head, threw them in a common grave. It's the NKVD and the Gestapo working together. So all this nonsense of, of there were this side and that side is all just that nonsense. That's right. FDR worked with Mussolini. FDR worked with Churchill. FDR worked with Bloody Joe Stalin. You need to know your enemies that are going to invade you were built by this government. You need to get that deep in your heart and right. never forget it. Amen. You need to realize that China was built by this government and London. Amen. Controlled by the Pope. <clears throat> um, after World War I, after they destroyed the Protestant British Empire, Protestant Prussian Empire, now they want to destroy the Protestant Prussian people. The purpose of World War II was to destroy Protestant Prussia. And that's why Hitler moved the capital from Jesuit Munich, Roman Catholic Munich, fanatical Catholic Munich, where the first 30, wars, 30 years war came from. They moved it from Munich to Berlin. And then carried Protestant Prussian Berlin. Because we have to have a whole world hate Protestant Prussia. And so as a result, they did this. Everything came out of Berlin. And so at the end of the war, they gave Berlin over to the fanatical Russian hordes, and they gang raped every woman they could find from about six years old to 76. So bad, so continual, that many of those women jumped in the wells to refuse to go through that anymore. They never taught us that in high school, did they? Never taught us that in college, did they? There were savages. And when General Patton got to Berlin, he was almost to Berlin, he was told to wait because the German army fought hard. They wanted to surrender all of Germany to the Americans because they knew the Russians would be vicious and cruel. But oh no, General Patton gets an order from dirty, stinking, traitorous Dwight D. Eisenhower. An order from that dirty, stinking Mason, George Marshall, to let Stalin have Prussia, to let Stalin have Berlin. Stalin's army was parked outside of Berlin. They could hear the shrieks and the cries and the torture and the murder and the rape until they were ultimately allowed to go in. Because you see, Protestant Prussia must be destroyed. There can be no nation on the face of the earth that is white, that is Protestant, and that is anti-Roman. That's how the South was. The South was, a, the, the America, the war between the states was a war of annihilation against Protestant Berlin, or Protestant Virginia, Protestant uh, North and South Carolina and Protestant Georgia. And those states treated their slaves well. I would gladly be a slave of some white land owner in Virginia, North and South Carolina, or Georgia. Right now, I'd trade my status right now to go there. Because number one, none of those slaves worked on Sunday. <clears throat> All those slaves could go to any church they wanted to. So it was a decimation of the white Protestant states. That was a, well, that's why they burned Columbia to the ground, South Carolina. That's why they destroyed Richmond. That's why they destroyed Atlanta. They didn't destroy uh, New Orleans, did they? No. Because it's Catholic. <coughs> you got to see the religious aspect, brethren. It's not politics. It's not economics. It's religion. And the Vatican is behind it all. And they do it behind the charade of politics and economics. Forget that stuff. The destruction of Japan. Why was there the mass firebombing of Japan where they firebombed Tokyo and all those cities? Why? <coughs> Why'd they do that? <coughs> well, the Japs attacked us. FDR and Hirohito, those two Masons, were working together 
to make sure Pearl Harbor happened, and I prove in my book that the USS Arizona was blown by the Office of Naval Intelligence 13 minutes into the attack, and no bomb ever penetrated through the double armored uh, deck of the Arizona. They had bombs in the magazine, and they blew it, and they made it look like the Japs bombed it, ensuring that there would be a war. Sure. So, and if you read Stennett's work, it came out a couple years ago, Stennett proves that they broke radio silence, that they knew they were coming, they yes. deliberately did let them do it. That's right. That's it. So all our guys were sacrificed by FDR, just like our guys were sacrificed in the World Trade Center to justify a papal crusade to get us all hyped up to go kill the Japs. It's the same way now, get us all hyped up to go kill the Muslim Arabs. Mm -hmm. When they had nothing to do right. with 9-11. That's right. Nothing. And I'll debate Sean Hannity any day of the week. Amen. Bring them on, Mo Riley too. Those <laughs> Irish Catholics, this Irish will give them a go. <laughs> when an Irishman resists another Irishman, you got a problem. <laughs> Especially when one Irishman knows he's right because it's not the word of God, and this other guy's got a little scenario for you. Sure he does. So, <clears throat> why the firebombing of Japan? Because you see, Japan had expelled the Jesuits for 250 years. Payback time. <clears throat> Payback time. Payback. From 1614 to 18, actually 73, when the J Japanese lived a, a Christian band. Dresden. Dresden. Dresden was the most beautiful Protestant city in Germany. It was the place where the Tsar retreated to. It was a non-military target. It was the destruction of a beautiful Protestant city, and that dirty, stinking FDR and Winston Churchill worked together, bombing it at night by the British and in the afternoon by the Americans, to destroy about one million people because all the wounded soldiers on the Eastern Front, which were primarily Lutheran Protestants, were in recuperating in Dresden. But that's to get them back for what Goering did when Goering bombed Coventry. Coventry was another Protestant city. It was Anglican. Gearing was a mason. He was addicted to cocaine, morphine. He was a punk. He created the Gestapo and handed it over to Himmler. It was Gearing who gave the order to bomb Coventry. The destruction of Protestant Coventry in England, Protestant Hull in England. They bombed um, that big church in uh, London. What was it? Uh, James Church? Uh, St. James, I think? In which was also the largest Jewish community in London. So they got to kill lots of Jews near that church in London. It's all religion. It's all Vatican. And so that's what they did. Uh, so when we see this urban renewal, what they did to Virginia, you, know, you realize West Virginia is not a state. Right. It's a non-state. Non West Virginia is Virginia. But what do they do after the war? During the war, they did the same thing to Virginia what they did to Germany. They divided, conquer it, and separate its power. Because you see, without the great state of Virginia, there is no America. Virginia created the, the Confederate United States of America, or the federal, federated United States of America. Excuse me, all great statesmen, all great generals were Virginians. Okay, so that's Dresden, that's World War II. And we can't forget Operation Barbarossa. Operation Barbarossa starts in what, uh, June of 1941. It's the largest invasion in the history of the annals of military warfare. Over 3 million men, 3,500 tanks, and guess what? Stalin was busy giving grain and gas to, to the Nazis before they invaded, up to the day before their invasion. 100,000 gallons, I think, a month, and 100,000 tons, I think, a month for the German army in preparation for its invasion. And Joseph Stalin killed any messenger that came to him and said, they're going to invade Russia. Had him killed. Because Stalin and Hitler are working together. They want a successful invasion. Because when Hitler comes in, he's going to bring the SS. And the SS is modeled after the Jesuit order. 
and they're going to bring the SD, which is the intelligence. And the SS are going to round up the Jews, and they're going to massacre them because that's why they were put together in the Pale of Settlement. Get them all in one place so we can easily massacre them. It's not it's no coincidence that all the Orthodox churches were converted to Catholic churches. That's right. And ones that weren't were converted into barns and museums and all that. It was a war against Orthodox Russia because you have three Romes. You have Rome, of course. You have Constantinople, which is the second Rome. And you have Moscow, which is the third Rome. They'd taken Constantinople. They took Constantinople with really Islam in 1453. And so that was the end of the Orthodox <coughs> there in Turkey. See, the devil's destroying where the seven churches were in the book of Revelation. They had to get Moscow. Edmund Walsh, the Jesuit from Georgetown University, who was with FDR when FDR formally recognized Russia in 1933, there in the White House with him, said that the fall of Russia was the most significant event since the fall of the Roman Empire. Why? Because that's when the Jesuits took Orthodox Russia. And they secreted out the Tsar. He was never killed. Because he was a knight of Malta. Working with his cousin, King George V of England. <coughs> he was another stinking knight of Malta. And then they blamed it on the Jews. That the Jews killed the Tsar. So they could create more anti-Jewish fury in Russia in the future. That's what they did. And that's how they're doing it here. So we have World War II. World War II was a tremendously orchestrated crusade of Rome. In fact, Eisenhower wrote a book called Crusade in Europe. <laughs> crusade in Europe. He was a crusader. Hitler was a crusader. Mussolini was a crusader when he destroyed the Orthodox Church in North Africa. Mussolini was a, uh, Stalin was a crusader. Oh, that's right. All advised by Roman Catholics. And Stalin had a secret conquered out with Rome. Because you see, Edmund Walsh, who was a Jesuit from Georgetown University in 1922, went on a trip to Russia for two years called a relief mission, quote unquote, where he was given full authority to negotiate for the papacy with the Bolsheviks <laughs> that the Jesuits ran. Okay. And what did he do? He made Joseph Stalin the secretary of the Communist Party in 1922 for the rest of his life. So he died to lose poison in 1952. Stalin was the inquisitor for the Vatican, killing Jews in Russia, killing Orthodox leaders, killing uh, Roman Catholics uh, that were, were loyal, that were nationalistic. He was the one who locked down the food in the Ukraine, killed 7 million Ukrainians, the vast majority were Orthodox. It was a huge inquisition with these men of different countries working together, all under the Pope, watching the whole thing and the Jesuits orchestrating it through their secret societies. And whoever wasn't a Jesuit was a high mason to, to help them along. And that's exactly what they're going to do here. The most significant Protestant area in this country is the South. What do you think the Jesuits have planned for the South? Some kind of terrorist attack. Terrorist attack, that's right. We're going to probably have, well, we're going to have another shock and awe event. And I say it's, and I believe, if I was the Jesuit general, I would pick the areas of my greatest enemies. Number one, I want to kill as many Jews as I can. I, that's what the Jesuit general would say, okay? Not what I'm saying. <laughs> Therefore, I want to go after New York City. There was a movie out called Escape from New York City. Yep. Where they made man Long Island one huge prison. I believe they're going to do something like that. Wouldn't be hard. All you got to do is close three bridges. You got over a million Jews there. You can kill a million Jews real quick. Where's the second high population of Jews? Miami. Miami. Miami, the Golden Coast. That's right. <coughs> so therefore, we have a movie that came out. Because remember, the Jesuits run Hollywood. The Vatican runs Hollywood through their high Jews. Remember, Steven Spielberg's a knight of Malta, and he's a knight of the British Empire. Yeah. Right? So what do they do? They have a movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger, that fanatical Roman Catholic whose father was a Nazi and he's a fascist. And they portray a nuclear detonation in the Florida Keys. By the way, Florida is to be a staging base for the Muslims landing in Cuba to come into Florida. Why wouldn't they do that? You're softening up the invasion territory. That was part of those hurricanes they sent us a year or two ago. All those five or six hurricanes? 
They couldn't have done better with bombs. So <coughs> we're softening up the southern coast right. for, our, for our invasion because what do we got here? We got a bunch of Baptists, those damnable Baptists. <laughs> we can never get them to comport with what we want. They're a bunch of obstinate heretics. That's what they are, according to Connor Canon Law. We will never depart from that Bible. We will never accept the jurisdiction of the Bible. <coughs> we will never accept this temple power. Amen. Okay? So the only thing for you, brother, is death. The only solution for you is a concentration. <coughs> so therefore, they're softening up the southern coast. And they made sure they brought a bunch of the Roman Catholic Cubans in here. Sure. Under Jimmy Carter. Okay? And remember, those poor Cubans, I feel sorry for them. Because it's the CIA, it's the Vatican CIA, that took Cuba from them and put Fidel Castro there. That's right. The first thing I would do as president, I wouldn't go to Iraq, I'd go to Cuba. And I'd get rid of him, and I'd say, oh, you Cubans in Miami, now you can go home. But they don't want to do that. They want to keep the agitation <coughs> going. So, you have the Golden Coast, and the other area, the third highest Jewish population is in Los Angeles. So, it wouldn't surprise me if they're going to pull something in Los Angeles. To the Los Angeles, Miami, or New York. At Houston. least that's where I would do it. Houston. Houston. That's another place too. <coughs> there's Jewish community there. Oh, are there really makes, that's where that's where all your main Jewish politicians have come from. Well, Houston. that also makes sense why they evacuated everyone. The, from, the from problem in New Orleans to Houston. Brought them to Houston. That's right. That makes perfect sense. Wow. Because the blacks hate the Jews. Mm -hmm. They hate their guts. The crime rate. The crime, the crime rate is going through the city. It is. became the same as it was in New York. That's, that's right. right. That's right. And by the way, Lindy Boggs, the wife of Hale Boggs of the Warren Commission, she's a big Dame of Malta in New Orleans, and she was with that whole deal, and she was behind the murder of her husband in 1972 or so. And Lindy Boggs got the highest award Loyola University could give out of New Orleans called Inter Integratus Vitae. That correct. One of the big Jesuit colleges here in America, besides Georgetown and Brown. PCC, Bob Jones. Boston College. <laughs> <laughs> Serious? There's no doubt there's Jesuit Masonic influence of Bob Jones, that's right. Baylor. Major Masonic. Oh, yes, Major Masonic. Sure. Is Yale one of the kingdoms? Yale is historically Protestant, but it's Masonic. Major Jesuit's controlled. Because remember, in New Haven, what else do you have in New Haven other than Yale and Skull and Bones? What else is there? Headquarters for the Knights of Columbus in New Haven. So the Knights of Columbus and the Bones are all working together. But the big Jesuit colleges are... Crown, West Coast. Boston I mean, all the Christian colleges. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, uh, the, all the Christian colleges are going to hand you Westcott and Mercury Tech. Right? Okay, um, and on the East Coast, you have Georgetown. You have Fordham. Fordham. Remember, every Jesuit university is a military fortress. It is not a school for education. It is that's their open policy. Their secret but true policy is it's a military fortress where they concoct all their plans. Mm -hmm. So, with 9-11, what do we have? Why, at 9-11, we have Fordham University in the Bronx. The Jesuits at Fordham, one of their, and uh, Fordham, his name is Avery Cardinal Dulles. Avery Cardinal Dulles is the son of John Foster Dulles, that night of Malta and Jesuit coadjutor that helped build the Cold War. Avery Dulles is the nephew of Alan Dulles, who was the head of the CIA, who killed Kennedy and caused all the other fascist revolutions in South America. The killing of Allende, and the removal of the Mosa Diana, Iran, et cetera, et cetera. No nationalism can exist. No nationalists in any country can exist. We have to kill them all, or we have to drive them from power. And they've done that in every country. We have, uh, and so we have the Jesuits of Fordham. Who are they overseeing? They're overseeing the Archbishop of New York. Edward Cardinal Egan. Edward Cardinal Egan, he is the head of the Knights of Malta, uh, really, in the country. There's three branches, but the, the New York branch is the most powerful. And lo and behold, there's a guy, it's a Knight of Malta, subject to Egan, at the time of 9-11, who just happens to be the director of Central Intelligence, George J. Tennant. George J. Tennant was an Ida Malta. George J. Tennant is a CFR member. George J. Tennant is the boy, the slave of Edward Cardinal Egan. And Egan brought down the World Trade Center using the CIA. And also remember that Al-Qaeda terrorist network, quote unquote, is Masonic. 
It was built by the CIA. They are their Arab gophers. The, Arab, the Al Qaeda is not our enemy. It is a tool of the CIA right. to bring about their terrorism and then to blame it on the Muslim people. That's it. When I went to yes, what would be your predictions for uh, candidates for both sides? We'll do the same. Thing. Both parties. What would be your just your your prediction? <coughs> who they're going to throw up? Who's going to run? Or who well, who they're going to nominate on either side? Well. Right, it doesn't matter to see if our controls them both. But that guy Warren right. went to the last uh, Bilderberg meeting. Uh, Who is Warren out of West Virginia? Uh -huh. uh, well, here's what I think. <clears throat> I think that no matter who wins, of course, you know there's no federal election. Right. right. So that's why I don't vote in a federal election. I never right. know. It's a waste of time. You vote in your state levels, and you pay your state tax apportionately. But you don't pay an income tax on your state level. You pay a put a portion tax. You fill out your form, this is what I think I owe every person in the state ought to pay, and that's what you send it in. But So you support your state level, but forget the federal, because there isn't anything the federal does for you. Nothing. Except make the world hate your guts. Yeah. That's right. So, um, what I think with regard to the federal elections, or federal appointments of who's going to be president, is this. Rudolph Giuliani was a very faithful boy in 9-11. Sure he was. <laughs> yeah. He was in building number seven that they later brought down eight hours later, and they don't have a reason to lie. <laughs> Why? How did that building come down? So neat and tidy. So neat and tidy. So because he was a good boy in 9-11, they're going to run him for the Republican candidacy, along with John McCain. John McCain has the backing and blessing of Edward Cardinal Egan. He was the speaker at the most recent Al Smith dinner of last year. I saw it, calling him his eminence, and just right. kissing up to the archbishop, oh, all over him, lap dogging. So <clears throat> I think that they're going to run those two Republican quote unquote candidates. Uh, and that will be a shoe in because Barack Obama um, is a Muslim. He was trained in a Muslim school. His middle name is Hussein. <laughs> and, they, and the Jesuits are all behind him, portraying him as some sort of a philosopher king. Yeah. Charlie Rose, he's a Jesuit. Yeah, I saw him on the program there. And they're interviewing him, how a wonderful person he is, and he becomes so prophetic. Osama bin Laden, oh, oh, Barack Obama can't win. Hillary Clinton can't win. So what they're doing is, I believe, they're giving a shoe-in for, for another Republican administration that's going to continue the war in Iraq. They're going to continue the Pope's crusade. Because after all, Newt Gidrick said it's going to last between 30 to 50 years. Condoleezza Rice, that prostitute to her own black people, if she had any allegiance to her own black people, she would say, I have nothing to do with these white Roman Catholic fascists. I'm done. But you see, she was trained at Notre Dame. Sure, she oh, was. Boy. So why would she ever be trained? She's a good slave and a rich one. <laughs> She's got her own oil tanker called the Condoleezza Rice. No, really? Yeah. That's Remember the CFR? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's why I didn't wear my gold tie. I thought it would spook you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's what I tend to think they're up to. I tend to think they're going to have a shoe-in for another quote-unquote radical red Republican administration. Because remember, the Republicans have always been evil. Absolutely. Always, always been evil. Always. They've never been pure. They were the ones that wrecked the South with Thaddeus Stevens. I, you know, when I lived in Lancaster, I used to make a regular trip to his grave to spit on it. <laughs> and I'd have done something else if it wasn't a decent exposure, too, but I just spit on his grave. Do you know anything about the, in this area, it's Phyllis Shack? Phyllis Dame of Malta. It's a Dame of Malta. Fake, Jeff. fake uh, conservative. So they're all dames of Malta, they're all right-wing fascism. The Democratic Party is the Communist Party, the Republican Party is the Fascist Party, and extremes meet, and they meet in the CFR, and that's why you will never have any of them say, well, you know what, I think we ought to give the American people their gold back. <laughs> I think we ought to give the American people their silver back that LBJ took in 1965. I think we ought to stop taxing these people's wages as though it's income, you know, because after all, we're destroying these people. And now they've got to work two jobs. And now we have divorce through the ceiling because dad can't be at home because he's busy working and we're going to keep pressuring those people until they can't take it anymore. 
We don't want to do that. See, any nationalist wants to bless his people. That's right. That's right. So there, and there isn't anybody that's going to say, well, you know what, folks? The reason why we have a gold trim flag here is because we don't have any courts anymore. What can't just going to tell us that Ron Paul won't even do Ron Paul's a fake. Yep. He is a traitor, just like Robert E. Lee was a fake and a traitor. Yep. I deal with Lee in my book with some 20 pages. Do you realize Stonewall Jackson could have destroyed the Federal Army five times? That's it. Amen. Five times. And Lee forbade him to do it every time except he consented to Chancellorsville. The reason why the Confederates lost Antietam is because they found the Confederate plans wrapped up in a cigar. Uh, the same snappy brand that launched Yeah. So what happened is Robert E. Lee, and you must get a book called Lost Victories by Bevan Alexander. Bevan Alexander is probably our greatest American military historian. He shows you in that tremendous book that the, uh, Jackson could have won, could have destroyed the Federal Army four times, and on his fifth time, he, did, he purposed that Lee said, he said, let me do it. And Lee said, well, go ahead. Instead of saying, he didn't praise God, let's wipe him out. <laughs> Lee was a traitor, and that's why they gave him good press after the war and made a hero out of him. They killed Jackson. Lee arranged Jackson's murder. You realize he didn't die because he was shot. He was shot in the left arm, and, and, uh, and they, they uh, cut off his arm, but Jackson was recovering. And the doctor that cut off his arm, he was, he was, his name was McGuire, Hunter McGuire. He was a mason. He was 24 years old. He was a major. And Hunter McGuire took Jackson 24 miles away to Guinea Station. And when he got in there, Jackson was ready to go back to the field. He said, I don't want to be here. And what happened? McGuire poisoned him with antimony and mercury. The last picture you ever see of Jackson, with that wonderful portrait when he's sitting like this, he's got his arm amputated, but you don't see it because of his sleeve. He had been poisoned for the first time. They poisoned him twice. And they killed him. They poisoned him off in a little shed away from the farm and kept his wife away from him. And Dabney won't tell you that. All the good Confederates will never tell you he was poisoned, but he had all the symptoms of poison. And then after, in 1881, when they were going to move his body, they dug up his grave, and his body wasn't there. All that was left was a bunch of bones and a blue overcoat. The Vatican steals the bodies of their enemies. And I believe they have a museum in the Vatican with all these dead bodies that they say, there's Jackson. And there's Lincoln, yeah, we used him, but he didn't want to consolidate power, so we got him here too. They, come, they collect all their enemies, and they're, they're <coughs> sorcerers, they're evil, wicked sinners serving the devil. Does that have anything to do with the collection of uh, the Indian drone, Geronimo, or by the skull and bone? Well, sure. Yeah. Well, Geronimo, of course, if you read Brady's work, and I, I like that Baptist preacher, he has a doctorate in history, and he says that Geronimo was the same man. He got the gospel got to him and he got saved. And, and so, of course, the devil's men in jail would want to dig up his skull and desecrate his tomb, I'm sure. That's what's happened, and uh, I guess we're going on to 12, and if you want to take a break, we can. And prepare some questions if you have. I will deal with any topic you want to deal with. And, uh, thank you for enduring. There's places to eat in this area, there's wherever you want to go.